Well, hopefully everybody's seen it so far. Uh, t -t -t. Well, it looks like we got most people here. Um, sorry about this. Evidently, the recorder didn't start when I hit the button. I just checked it. And it's going. Um, so um, why don't we do another example that's a little bit bigger, and then people who the recorder missed on will, uh, will be able to fill in. OK. So let's say we want to pick. Actually, let me start to make it kind of more interesting. Let's say I want to make a uh, a counter that was, um, let's say, a, a binary counter, or say, let's say, a, a mod three counter. So what I want to be able to do is to count zero, one, two. And any time the input was a one, I wanted it to count. And any time it was a zero, um, I wanted it, let's do a real simple thing. We'll just say, anytime I got a zero, I want it to stay. And then my output is, I want to output the number that it's at. So that means I'd have two bits of zero, I'd have two bits giving me one, and I'd have two bits giving me two. All right? Now, when I do this, I go, okay, I've got this all covered. But technically speaking, I'm doing two bit states here, right, for zero, one, two. So I really at least have a state three. And so, you know, or sorry, yeah, state three. So maybe I want to consider one of these and say, um, what would happen if I'm in state three? And here, I don't want to um, output any of these numbers. So maybe I have it do a one, one, so I see an error code. And then I'll make you transition up on a zero. If you just keep holding the count button, I don't know when to stop. So you have to send me a, you know, we'll say zero is kind of a clear. All right. So this only happens if there's an error, some glitch happens, some unexpected thing. Fair for a, a problem in a description. Well, I got at least one, one yet. Okay. Um, so with this situation then, right, part of the advantage of this is you can see how easy it was to describe it, right? I've got a counter, so you can see it counts from zero to one to two, right? And then it's mod three, so it goes back to zero. So it's easy to see how a description of something can actually readily lend itself to a graph. And this is why engineers when we're designing right our initial thoughts often come in as graphs because it's very easy to think oh i've got a count or i've got to do you know whatever some type of a simple task and i can often describe it as a graph and then i'll get things like error states and other stuff like that well now the question is is there anything i can do to reduce this right well now in this case we'd expect probably not on these things, but eh, at least worth looking at. Okay, so I can make my table. So I have to have my current state, which is going to be either zero, one, two, or three. And I've got my input, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one. I've got my next state. We'll have our output. <clears throat> so I'll walk through them. Right? If I'm at state zero, my output is always going to be zero, zero. If I'm at state one, my output is zero, one. If I'm at state two, my output is one, zero. If I'm at state three, my output is one, one. Just out of curiosity, what type of machine is this?
Yes. So this this graph is describing a, a state machine, right? So we generally call whatever we're building here a state machine. This is a state table that's describing it. This is a state graph, but we're basically building a state machine. So we had mentioned that there were different two general types of state machines that we used, Mealy and Moore. So is this Mealy, is this Moore? It is more. Very good. And it's more because the outputs depend only on the state. So if the outputs are inside the circles, then you know you have a more machine. When the outputs are on the input lines, it is likely a Mealy machine. Okay. Now I say it's likely a Mealy machine because it technically could be, if you look at both, right, the zero and the one coming from a state, the outputs, I mean, I could technically have said, 0, 1 slash 0, 1. I'd be writing it in a Mealy style, but I could also do it as a more by just reducing them in. So if the outputs are the same, even though it's written Mealy when it's on the arrows, you can sometimes make a more machine out of it. Uh, and remember, more machines are safer. safer. Mealy machines are a little smaller. Um, and you can see that in that if I had a Mealy machine, and I had two different outputs, I could actually split the state, increase the number of states, and make one state have one output and the other state have the other. So I can also kind of go the other way to convert, to make a Mealy machine into a more machine, to make it safer, but then I have to increase the number of states to account for the outputs. Um, so that's, that's why I say mores tend to be more, they're bigger. All right. Um, so let's do our, our next state portion of it. We've done all of our outputs, and then we'll take a look at our next states. If I'm at a zero and I get a zero, I go to zero. If I'm at a zero, I get a one, I go to one. So at a zero, get a zero, go to zero. At a zero, get a one, go to one. That's these two arrows put in. If I'm at a one, I can get a zero or one. So if I'm at a one, I get a zero, I stay at one. Add a one, get a one, go to two. Add a two, get a zero, stay at two. Add a two, get a one, go back to zero. Add a three, get a zero, go to zero. Add a three, get a one, stay at three. Good. We have converted from our, our graph to a table. Now we can look at these and just compare the outputs. And all the outputs for the states are different. If the outputs at this level are different, I don't even have to look at the next state. Outputs are different. They cannot be the same. So trivially, there is no way to reduce this because the outputs exactly the same. Does that make sense? Yes, no. Awesome. So let's say I want to make, take something that's similar to this, but what if I want to just change the outputs? Right? Because this is trivial. There's no way I can reduce it. As far as state purposes is, you're ready to build this thing. Let me change my outputs. I'm going to keep my two bits, but I'm going to give them separate meanings now or different meanings. Um, whenever I'm at a zero, I'm going to output a one in the for, for the first bit. So it's the only one that's going to get a zero, or sorry, a one on the first bit. So that means I'm kind of at my ground state. Okay? The second bit means, am I in an error state? So I'm not in an error state. I'm not in an error state. I'm not in an error state. I'm in an error state. So 
So I just really want to be able to distinguish, am I at my base case, right? Am I in an error? That's the only two ones that I can really tell the difference. So when I put them in here, zero gets one, zero, one gets zero, zero, two gets zero, zero, and three gets a zero, one. Now the question is, can I tell the difference? Well, one zero, this state can't be combined with any because it's outputs different. And this one can't be combined. So the only two that might, and it's a might, but they have the same outputs, is states one and two. Okay. So those are the only two we have to be able to compare. Now, for this to be the same, right, I have to have that state one is equal to two. So one is equal to two if one is equal to two. That's kind of your nicest condition. It's kind of a, you know, um, they are if they are. So if that's the only thing that's limiting you from making them equal, then they're equal. And then we have to have that, but we also have to have two equals zero. Right? Sorry, two also has to be equal. So one has to equal two and two has to equal zero. The first one's next state, the zero case state has to be the same, and the one input has to go the same. So then we can just check, is two the same as zero? And two is not the same as zero because they have different outputs. So again, it comes down to those outputs. Right? So this one is not met. This one is trivially met, but since that one is not met, I can't remove it because I would be able to tell the difference because it would take me two ones before I get an output. And here I'd only take one, one. Right. Okay, is that good? So that's about all we can do on this one. Let's move to a slightly bigger problem then. I'm gonna give my states names now. One goes here, uh, zero goes here, and it outputs whatever those two say. B, one goes here, and B, one goes there. Actually, I'm going to have all of these on ones go to C. I'll output one and go to one. B will stay at itself on a zero. And D will go to B on a zero. And let's see. F will go to E. C my one will stay at itself but won't output anything. And on a one, it will go to F and not output anything. All right. So we have a slightly more complicated diagram. And I submit to you that it wouldn't be quite so easy to figure out where we go. Now, since this is bigger. We often want to streamline our, our tables a bit. So what we'll often do is we'll just list current state. And we drop the input. We drop the input because we do next state 
if the input is a zero and next state, if the input is a one. Is that good? Input of both the C's the same. I only have one C. Um, so let me walk through one slash zero. Yes, so let me just run through all the states and I'll mention. This is state A, state B, state C. That's D, E, and F. So those are my states. CS is current state. NS is next state. And this is next state when the input is a zero. And this is next state if the input is a one. Is that readable? Oh, very bad. I thought I had said zero on zero. My bad. Thank you. So are we... <laughs> okay. Is it all readable and we're good so far? Good now. That's awesome. Keep me honest. Okay. So we've got our next dates, and then we're going to do our outputs. So we have our output. And again, the first one is going to be if the input is equal to zero. And I usually just put a subscript zero just because it saves me time instead of writing n equals zero above them. And n equals one, I'll just say out one. It's the output if it's a one. Then I only have to do one row per state. And it's still every bit as, as easy to write them. So. Okay, I'm going to put a single line to separate. Remember, double separates from inputs to what is essentially an output, a next state, or whatever. Okay, so my possible states A, B, C, D, E, and F. I'm going to do a line every two just to make it more readable. From A, I've got all right, on a zero, I get a zero and go to D. So my next state on a zero is D, and I output a zero. On a one, which are these two, I output a one and go to B. Good. Okay, so B. So for B, uh, T, 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 T. Oh, I never gave a zero state for that one. Um, uh, okay. I'll take it as yes. And that looks hard to read. That's a slash. Okay, so B on a zero is going to stay at itself and output a zero. On a zero, oops, oh, that was actually, stays a B, outputs a zero. Oh. On C or one, I output a one and I go to C. And if I'm at C on a zero, I stay at C, and I output a zero. And C on a one goes to F, and it outputs a zero. And D on a zero goes to B, outputting a zero. And D on a one would go to C and output a one. E on a zero stays at E, outputs a zero, and 
E goes to C, one and a one. And F goes to E, to a zero, outputting a zero. And F on a one goes to C and outputs one. Okay. So we've now taken this and reduced it to here. So we'll take a quick check. Did I get right? Do we all agree? No copy errors. Awesome. We all agree. Okay. Um, so we can look through this. And again, there's we only have to compare ones where the outputs are the same. So these zero ones are possibly, but this zero zero has to be unique. This is guaranteed to be a unique. We don't even have to consider it. Right? C is not the same as anything else. Right? It's the one that's guaranteed to be unique. Okay. Everybody else has the same outputs. So they're all pretty equivalent. There's an awful lot of them. So I'm going to erase this. And we'll do an implication table up above to keep track of it all. Like I said, it is recording. I just checked it. So hopefully that means you can also go back. Okay. So I'm going to list my possible states that I have to look at. A, B. I'm not going to do C because I already know it. Um, D, and E. And then I've got B, D, E. And F. Right. So I have this lovely chart now. So I want to check and see if they're equivalent to them. So we'll check first A and B. Right. And everything in here we've already checked out the same outputs. So then I have to see, does D equal B, right? So, oh, sorry, does DB equal BC? So that's for A to be B, D has to be B, B has to be C. Okay. For A to be D, well, actually, we can actually stop at this point, right? Because D equals B, we don't know, right? D, sorry, B, D, we don't know yet. But B and C, we know, because remember, C was unique. C wasn't anybody. I don't even know what goes on the bottom side. Oh, you just start at the top, and you just list them, up to and including the, you just don't do the last one. Because remember, the last one technically would just give you the diagonal saying does F equal F. So you just list them all. I dropped off C because I already know C isn't equivalent to anything. So why bother checking it? Right? So I'm just lazy, so I left C out because I know C is never going to reduce. So I only put the things that could reduce together. Does that make sense? Okay. Oh, so, but since B has to be equal to C, and C is its own little world, C cannot be the same as anybody. I know this one is not met, which means this whole thing is gone. So I know A and B cannot be the same. All right. All right. How about A and D? Well, for A and D to be the same, that means D has to be B. That's possible and B has to be C. That's not possible. So those two cannot be the same. Right? A and E. So we'll check A and E. B has to be E. Who knows? B has to be C. No way. Right? A and F. B has to be E, possibly. B has to be C. No way. So A will not reduce. So now we know A is its own unique state. 
even though all the outputs were the same, I, I can tell a difference by when A would hit B. And A hits B immediately next, but the other ones don't necessarily, and they don't hit it on the same input. So there's no way I can combine A with any other state. Okay, so now we can go to B. So we're going to compare B to D. So we say B and D. B, C, B, C. They are exactly the same. Right? Since they're the same, we can go, yay, B and D are the same. So that means I don't need D. So I can look and find if D is anywhere in my chart. If it is right there, right? A would go to a D. D and B are equivalent to each other. So I can replace this by a B. Does that make sense? Okay. So we now go to the next one, B and E. So we compare B and we compare E. So B is equal to E. If C is C, it is. If B is E. So B is E if B is E. So this is, I kind of mentioned this before, this is one of those lovely recursive things that's going on. They're the same if they're the same. Right? Um, so, but there's, what this means is nothing's actually stopping them. I could have two ones that are just completely independent timelines, right? So imagine, I'm not going to label these states. Imagine I had states that were completely parallel to each other. Right? Oh, and, you know, I had all the transitions exactly the same. I just literally copied it, right? So you can imagine if I copied it and I copied all the inputs on them. Even if these states won't compress, you would be able to tell if you're on this side or this side. Right? And there's no way to do it other than just noting, oh, right? They're the same if they're the same. Well, that's, you know, it's a case of, you know, pure parallelism in this spot. So B equals B if B equals E, that's awesome. I can reduce them. So I can get rid of those. And if there's any E's somewhere else, I can get rid of them. So E is here and I get rid of an E by making it a B. Okay, here's B, F. And I have B, C, B, C. Right. So yes, that reduces. So B is equal to F, which means I can get rid of that one also. And any reference to F, I can replace by B. Now the rest of these I can check E and D, well, E and D are equal to each other, right? All the rest of these are because they are compressed. They've already been removed. So technically I can remove their, their lines from this chart as well. So what I find is all that middle zone that I did in there ends up turning out to be exactly the same. I could have just done a three input sequence, which was my plan to have something that compressed, but you know, the A didn't. Okay, do we feel good with the idea of state reduction? So I'm pretty happy with it. I don't want to put too fine of a point on this. Um, it's a pretty straightforward process. It's tedious. Um, it's often done best on a computer uh, when you get to any decent size, but you should at least know how to do it. And, um, particularly for a computer doing this type of an exhaustive chart is a really good system because you can just program it to loop and anytime it changes a value inside the table, you just tell it to look through it again. So uh, that's a fairly standard way of, of implementing these. There are some programs that will do that type of a checking for you. Okay. Now we've been giving names to these ABC, right? How do we actually pick a name? 
So let's say we had three states, A, B, C. Well, I've got to eventually turn this name into some binary sequence. So the most common way everybody's used to is just binary numbering system. So we go 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0. I'm all done, right? It's nice. It's compact. There's no waste um, other than the fact that, you know, there is a 1, 1 state that you don't need. But essentially, this allows me to get a nice sequence on here that uses very little memory. Um, it uses the same number of bits of log base 2 of whatever I have here. So um, that's a, a nice, efficient system on here. There is a little bit of a problem, though. And that problem comes from this transition to here. When I go from 1 to 2. Oh, and this is kind of a little bit of a fine point to deal with, but imagine for a sec when these are flipping, right? Oh, for a brief instant, unless you really synchronize these very, very well, and I can synchronize them well if the clock conditions are met, but realize if, if I'm not really careful on synchronizing them like an FPGA does and checking the clocks, it is possible for these to take multiple clock cycles. And if that does, one of these two bits might change before the other. And that creates a chance for an error. Well, that's actually one of the big dangers that we have when we go to asynchronous design. I don't want to get into asynchronous design, but I think it's good to at least note it. Um, this is called a race condition, that these two bits are racing to see which one flips first. And depending on what happens, all kinds of things could go on. If this flips off first, you'd go to zero, zero. Now, if you've got an FPGA and it meets the timing constraints, then this is totally safe. And, uh, but realize if I go to asynchronous or things of that sort or somebody doesn't time things correctly, they could end up with a problem. Um, so we often don't like these two-bit flipping type situations. It also makes a lot of our circuits a little bit uglier. So I could consider doing a gray code. Now only one bit flips at a time. I've got a good numbering system. When you go to do encirclements, things are next to each other and I get a very efficient design. So this is nice if you're gonna do Carnot maps, if you're looking for efficiency on, on counting or other types of things that are fairly sequential. So if you see a loop where all the states are kind of going around in the outside, um, these type of a kind of looks like this where each of these circles imagine as a state with a name, right? And it just keeps going all the way around, right? If you see something like this that's very sequential, right, or a straight line, things of that sort, gray code is often a pretty good one. And you just pick your whatever is your first state, you know, as the zero, zero state, and it just kind of counts nicely around. Then depending on how many of these, you would only have one that, you know, might not be a nice transition. So gray code is often a really nice way to do it. It's also compact like binary is um, and has a lot of those same type of advantages. It's not as easy to read the numbers out. There's your disadvantage. Um, but sometimes the simplicity of the design makes up for it. There's a trade-off between which of these you pick. Does that make sense so far? Okay. And the whole thing is, we just want you to think, you know, we put in the letters first, so you don't have to think about it. You can just get the idea down. When you're doing the initial design, you want to just think about the idea. You don't want to sweat small details, right? Once you've got it down, now it's the time to start sweating what's the best way to organize these. Another one that's very popular is called One Hot. So one hot is, um, it actually technically is exactly what the name says. Um, hot means that it's live or it has power. So one hot means only one bit is live at a moment. So we would number these for one hot. I'd need, I have three states, so I need three bits. And A would have one bit set. B would have a different bit set. 
and C would have a different bit set. Now, this requires more bits. I need as many bits as there are states, whereas these two only need log base two of the number of states. This needs the number of states as bits. So this requires more bits. This has a lot of advantages though, right? When I'm doing these type of transitions, I know if two bits are ever set, it's an illegal state. So when I'm moving from this one to any other state, right, uh, I know any of the in-betweens. It's either gonna go through one, one or zero, zero. And I know those are invalid states, so I just don't let them do anything. <laughs> I just let the other transition finish. Well, it's very easy then to do protections on these type of stuff. Um, the one hots also have simplicity. I can just look at this and tell which state I'm in because this bit, each of these bits is a state bit, right? So to figure an output for them, I just have to straight look at that state bit and act on it. So it's got a lot of advantages. It's really simple for a computer to do these assignments. So um, this one, believe it or not, this is what, if you don't specify the the bit patterns for your states um, when you're doing these type of designs. This is the default one most design systems will actually pick for you. Um, and a lot of systems, yes, you know, Verilog and the rest of those, you can set them so they're going to pick um, state numbers in sequence for you. Um, and this one hot is the default way to do it because it turns out that it's just really easy for a computer to handle that for you. These are probably the three most common. Um, there are a few other ones that will come in that will come in when we do counters. Um, so for instance, there are ones for like the Johnson counters and stuff like that, where they're gonna just take and feed the sequences back around. Um, now, one hot is a special case of a Johnson counter sequence um, that you can do. If you just take your, your bits, three bits, right, for a Johnson counter, you can just feed them back around. So, you know, one, zero, zero, if you transition them on, you get zero, one, zero, if you shifted them all, right, one, zero, zero, and they just keep rotating through. So you can rotate through all the sequences doing this type of stuff. We'll get more into these in the next chapter, uh, but there are some special ones that come in and it depends on what the power, uh, pattern is. Now a common sequence we'll do on some of these counters to get more bits out of it is to invert it when it comes around. So we end up getting the states, you know, initially we can actually have zero, 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 and then we'd have zero, zero, one, and then we'd have zero, one, one, because that zero comes around and it flips and becomes a one flips becomes a one and that sequence shifts over. So you'd have a whole bunch eventually to one, 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 and then it just keeps going back the other way. So you end up with a bunch more states that's on there that you can fit in, but still with a lot of unique identifiability and an easy way to count sequence between them. Uh, so if you do have to count states, but you want a one hot like thing, a lot of these special counters we'll deal with next chapter will give you nice sequences that let you get slightly more states without bits and have a lot of advantages. Not all the same advantages, but pretty similar. Uh, but your three main ones you're gonna deal with will be this, and this is a special case. These are your special counter states that's on. Uh, most of the time you're gonna probably pick this one though, because it's just, if you know nothing better, do this, unless you're a computer, in which case you know nothing better, you do that. If there's a nice sequence to it, then you do gray. Okay, we feel good about how we can pick conversions from state letters to numbering schemes. Seems like Jake is fastest on the keyboard here. <laughs> okay, so let's talk a little bit about how I can take, once I've got these named up, um, oops. 
how can I actually implement this type of a thing inside of a Verilog system? So very often when I'm doing these, I don't want to lose these initial names because some of my initial documentation will be like this. So we're going to use the keyword parameters. So imagine you're in, uh, let me do this first. I'll stick up module, you know, blah, blah. That has some inputs and outputs, right? A whole bunch of stuff up there. I want to get this ABC. I want to remember them, but let's say for instance, I've decided I want to do binary for them. Right? If I just put zero, zero inside a case statement or something to do transitions, there's no way you're going to be able to read those. It'd be a lot nicer to actually use the names ABC. So that's why we have this keyword parameter. Now you've encountered parameters before. If you remember when we were designing this, we had the ability to have another little optional section here where we stuck um, past parameters. It was just called parameters here, but in truth, they're past parameters. They're parameters that are passed to the system. I can also have local parameters. And so a parameter, the keyword appears inside instead of in this little extra square bracketed section. Then it's a local parameter, which just means a parameter that only is used inside the module. And I can just say A is equal to, I can be really formal here because I want it to be two bits. So I can say two bits, binary zero, zero. And B would be parameter B, two bits, binary zero, one and parameter C is two bits binary one zero. After this, I can do treat ABC as identical to these. So if I later on down the line here was inside some always, whatever, always at star case, whatever my state is, I could just say A colon, and A is two bit zero, and I could just say, what do I do as A? Right. But I submit to you that's easier to say state is A is a lot easier than state is zero, zero. So when you look it up on their documentation, you'd be able to easily look up and find, oh, this is A, and you say whatever you do for A, and B, and whatever you do for B, and C, whatever you do for C. This would be the one case where I wouldn't use a default to override one of these. If I wanted a default to distinguish from these, I just default and uh, I would specify the same exact thing. Um, you know, you could also just put next to the default, just say, you know, A is default if you wanted and then put A down there. Uh, but I do like to make sure I enumerate them all here. Even if I'm going to eventually say maybe C is default, so I'd say default to this, and I just above it, I put a comment C, you know, default is C. Usually you pick your default state, not to be which one's last in the sequence, but which one do you want it to start up with at the, at the beginning? And if there's an error, which one do you want to go to? So if you think at the very beginning and at everything else, there's usually kind of a startup or there's a, a problem happens, get me going again. So we often have a state that does all the initialization and cleanup. Um, it just gets things ready to go. If we make that state the default state, then it's a very helpful spot that we can just do default. And then if any weird thing happens, the design is automatically designed to take you to that fix the error and get it running again state. Um, so default is nice for doing that. But this using parameter here, um, is very helpful. Um, there is another type of parameter that's technically called a local param. It does very similar things. There's a subtle difference between them though. Um, parameter is safer. Local param inside here, you can technically, when you call this module, you can there are commands you can give that will modify local params, but there are not external params that will modify parameter. So my general recommendation is 
don't do local param unless you want the chance for some of the external to override them. So my general rule is don't do local param unless you really know what you're doing um, because it has a chance to be modified in ways you're not expecting, whereas parameters are pretty safe. So therefore, they should stay independent. Do we feel good about kind of implementing? So then I did binary here, but realize I could have put any of these codes in the spots and it would have been perfectly fine too. All right. Let's see, we got like nine minutes. Oh, that should be fun. So we've technically gone through all the key ideas I needed to do here. So let me actually, before I start something new, let me make sure everybody is, is kind of at a good ground inside the course. So um, I'm gonna open it up to all of you for questions and see if we've got Q and A. So here's the best way to do Q and A. Um, just, you can either type them and I'll try to watch the chat window here but my chat window is small, so if like multiple people type, um, it disappears off the screen. So I'll try to make my chat window bigger. It's really sensitive. Um, or you can just unmute yourself, state your question, and then mute yourself so we don't get feedback on sound when I answer. Open the floor up. You have a question regarding lab. Um, if I'm happy to answer questions regarding lab, let me just see if there's any questions on the main course. And if there's no questions on the course, then I will happily answer questions on, on lab. Is everybody good on the course then? Question on the lab? Um, so my understanding from it, because I'm just watching the feed like the rest of you are, I'm just in there in case people have questions, it makes it easier. Um, and it also, if I notice something that kind of stands out, I, I'll interject in and help out. Um, yeah, he only has the pre-lab that's up. Um, my understanding is that, um, it's been tough for a lot of people. There have been people who have had trouble getting the system running and um, it's always difficult. Like when you write something down, it makes sense when the person knows what you mean, but transitioning um, like written text doesn't do a great job for most people getting them to understanding. It helps them once they have understanding, which is why reading a book isn't as useful as this kind of a FaceTime discussion. We just seem to pick up information better from human beings. So right now, um, we're trying to figure out without a lot of FaceTime inside the lab thing, how do we get that information across to you? Um, and I know a lot of people have been struggling. The other thing that's been happening is not everybody's been able to uh, run Xilinx or other stuff. Um, so my suggestion is do the pre-lab and be ready. Um, I believe his general thing is he's trying to watch and if everybody does the pre-labs well he's assuming that you know things are they understand and then he goes ahead and does his um meeting times on thursday uh for to answer do q a on um, he hasn't been doing webex he's been doing something else but you know whatever the the messaging program he's been doing so my general recommendation is do the pre-lab if you if you look at it early 
you'll get a good chance to tell whether or not, you know, it, it makes sense. And that way you can, you know, look things up or ask questions or things of that sort. Does that help? And if any of you really get lost on any of these things, let me know. Um, I am getting hit with a huge number of emails. Uh, just to let everybody know, there's one more candidate for clinical. I mentioned last week a number of people showed up and gave me feedback. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, there'll be one more clinical candidate uh, tomorrow and Thursday. Under what tab do you post these recorded lectures? Um, so let me finish this and I'll explain that. Um, so there'll be one more a teaching thing Thursday at 11 a.m. Uh, so just before this class, it's 11 to noon. Um, and I really love to get feedback from students because, you know, you guys have a different perspective when you're having to listen and say, hey, would this person um, be a good person to teach me? So um, I will, in the announcements, put in a link to that again. So... <clears throat> Let me see if I can show you where. Okay, I'm going to attempt to share my screen. So um, hopefully everybody can see this. I can no longer see the chat window. So if you are not seeing, um, my page that has um, uh, Canvas, then uh, then please let me know by unmuting and saying I can't see it. Um, when you come into the course, so right now I'm, you can see I'm in EOC 2337. If I want to watch the videos that are done, I have to go to WebEx. And under WebEx, it you know tells me, hey, I'm currently hosting this one. Um, you know, I've got a few more minutes left to go. Because um, I think, yeah, I actually just listed it to uh, 2 o'clock. It really should be 145. So I'm actually almost done. Um, <clears throat> and then if you notice up here, there's event calendar. That's what you're looking at. Um, appointment booking and then event recordings. So if you click on event recordings, you'll see all of the different ones. So, um, these two are the two previous ones, and this is the current one. So um, it takes it a stupidly long time to process these videos. So um, you keep checking, check recording, and it'll say, there's no recording, there's no recording. And by tomorrow, sometime early, um, all of a sudden it'll be like, there's a recording. And then you'll see these view recordings. So you can click view recording. And it'll open this tab up and take forever and a half. And it'll give you a link if you just want to stream it or if you want to download it so you have a copy. And you can click whichever one you like to do it. I don't want to do it because the amount of data that requires would kill our session. But that's how you find them, and they keep coming in. Um, the unfortunate thing is this is not well integrated. Well, it looks like it's integrated. It's really not. I can't actually link these videos into my media to release it to you guys. So um, I've been downloading them, but they're stupidly huge. And they, then I have to re-upload. And my upload link is really slow. <laughs> so um, unfortunately, it just takes a long, long time. So um, you know, it, it will eventually get up there. But um, these are usually multiple gigs, uh, two to four gigs, something like that. And if I ever get a hiccup on my network, it kills the entire upload. <laughs> so I get very frustrated trying to upload, download, and then upload these things. It takes like four or five times. Um, so it can literally take days before I get a good upload. Um, so, um, but anyway, now you know how to find them. You just go to WebEx. Um, Oh, I'm sorry. I did forget to put on it because honestly, I forgot what day it was until it flashed up and said, it's Tuesday. And I'm like, ah, so, um, you know, my sorries. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I was, we were doing some, some moving stuff around and picking up groceries and stuff. So, um, then I noticed, uh oh, it was a Tuesday. So, 
Yeah, I actually kind of feel bad about that. I, I think this is the first time I've forgotten a Hawaiian shirt to a thing in like 15 years. <laughs> This is, yeah, I know, yeah, it's, I've been, <laughs> I'm going to stop sharing, I think, but um, I try to just because it's kind of like a fun thing, so this will be a fun thing, you actually caught me, so, you know, congratulations. <laughs> the other class didn't call me on it, maybe they didn't notice. <laughs> yeah, so I was trying to get the pictures, but I blew my phone up, and then my hard drive i ran out of space because i've been recording these videos and my hard drive crashed so i had to get an external drive and copy stuff over so i've got to re-photo stuff um so i had some frustrating events with my computer this last weekend um so i'm i'm gonna try to find out um i found an app that supposedly is going to do this a little easier um, for scanning them and getting them in but at least you have the scores so um, I didn't want you to have to wait on that anymore. So apologies on the delay. Um, anything else we need? I do want to be sensitive of your time. Well, awesome then. All of you have a great day. Um, uh, remember Thursday we don't have a class because um, I my actual WebEx is being used for the interview process. This is the last candidate. Um, so definitely watch for that link to get your opinion in because um, I do do very much value it. And um, I will try, I've been having problems uploading the videos, like I mentioned. So um, I will try to get some free time late at night and, and upload it. So without any further ado, have a lovely day all. If you've got questions, shoot me an email.